Welcome to Thinking Green. I'm Rana, and I'm really happy uh, tonight uh, to be catching up after pretty much a year, I guess, with Michelle Louise Bicking, who was our Green Party candidate for governor uh, last year. And <laughs> in 2022, uh, she and I actually spent quite a bit of time together. Oh boy. And in the last year, we really haven't. So mm -hmm. tonight we're going to catch up on, on what Michelle has been up to uh, over the last year and uh, talk about some of the issues of the day while we're at it. So welcome, Michelle. Thanks Thank for you. coming down to southeastern Connecticut. Yes, anytime. Always a joy to be with you. <laughs> Always a joy. So I guess maybe just start, I know you've been on the show before, but mm. maybe just start and talk about like, your background a little bit, some of the things you've been involved in over the years, and mm. I know it's a long <laughs> list, <laughs> and, and, and some of the projects you've been involved in, also a long list. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I always feel like I'm, 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 there's so much that needs to be done, and there's so many different ways that I can serve. Um, you know, it doesn't seem as long as it could be. Um, so, you know, I'm originally from New York. I have to always rep, you know, where I'm from. I've been in Connecticut for over 14 years now. Uh, raised my son here, um, work here um, for the state. And I think I've been a member of the Green Party for as long as I've been in state. And that's how we originally connected. I think so. Yeah. Um, and I think it was via email and listservs and stuff for Absolutely. at least five years in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I remember going to the different meetings, you know, different ends of the state. And I remember having a conversation with you saying, well, what do you, what do you think about running for Congress, Michelle? What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> and I remember telling you, no, I'm not, I'm not qualified. And you said you're more qualified than some people who have been in the business for much longer. So you'll, you'll be fine. Um, so, you know, I, mu I must also say that, you know, I as far as having someone's, you know, having a cheerleading section, Rona has always been that in terms of, you know, um, getting me used to the idea of public service in a different way, um, on a greater level, on a broader scale. Um, but yeah, you know, everything that I've done, you know, in recent years has revolved around um, working with families in a clinical capacity or, you know, outside of the, the, um, the clinic, you know, just being around and being a part of different initiatives um, on a local level. So, which is a very yeah. broad thing to say, but basically, I've been doing a little bit of everything, a little bit of everywhere. Well, I know that <laughs> when you've run for office, and you know, we put all your different professional qualifications oh, next gosh. to your name, it's a long list, mm. and you know, uh, you were. I mean, unfortunately, we didn't get ballot access in twenty twenty two, but mm -hmm. when you ran for governor. Uh, you know, like Bob Stefanowski didn't have a, a master's in public administration, nor right. does Ned, Ned Lamont have it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, some of the things you've studied, they haven't had that you would think would be associated with this sort of position. And then, right. in you know, in addition, you know, you're a social worker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think you've worked you know, on both spectrums of the ages, correct? Yes, across the entire spectrum. You know, my, my, role, my prior to working for the state um, as a clinical social worker, I was in hospice. You know, that, that still remains my, my true calling. Um, I love entries and exits. I'm wearing my, my, my little jacket slash uniform from um, uh, where I'm a certified uh, birth doula. Um, so, you know, since the the agency that I'm attached to is in Massachusetts. I can only do cesarean births. Um, but yeah, I always find myself at the point of entries and exits. I feel like that's where I'm most called to be. Uh, but yeah, it was interesting when I, when I was being interviewed, um, oh my gosh, I forget the radio station. Uh, Stefanowski was there and he walked right past me and then he walked back and looked at me. Are you Michelle? I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, how nice to meet you. I said, well, I didn't think you would even acknowledge me, sir, but nice to meet you, too. Um, oh, that is really interesting. Very interesting. Walked right by me and then walked right back. It was just really interesting. So well, It was nice that he walked back. He did walk back, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I, I think, again, you're just remembering what you told me, that I have a lot more to offer than I think I do. And, you know, I don't have to have so many commas 
in my bank account to show that I'm vested. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the communities of Connecticut, I have you know practical and real life experience that would be relevant to undertaking such a you know tremendous role as governor or any other position. You know, it really made a difference in seeing me through to the um, to the end of the campaign, and as well as still being present. I mean, they're they're not going to take my Green Party membership away from me. I'm green for life. You know, so. Well, and I'm not going to ask you to run for anything this year. If you show up in my driveway with another clipboard, Rona, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't. <laughs> well, we will be petitioning for ballot access in the presidential. Well, I'll uh, be there with you. I'll be but, there with uh, you. Yeah. So um, now, I thought to, to invite you to come back on the show because you would send out, you know, an email blast about uh, Project Tunnel Vision, yes. and I have to say that. You know, usually when a guest comes on the show, I research whatever I can about what their project is. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, I don't know a whole lot about uh, Project Tunnel Vision mm -hmm. in terms of either what inspired it or what you're doing. So well, you're in I good guess... company. You're in really good company, Rona. <laughs> <laughs> um... So maybe start with, like, what inspired this? I know yeah. you've been involved with a lot of different projects, but what's unique about this one? So I, I remember um, or late last year, I was having a conversation with two members of um, Black Lives Matter 860 um, about the stretch of wall that's across the street from the Connecticut Science Center, which is you know, you know, riddled with different kinds of graffiti in different stages of devolution. And I was like, you know, what, what? And I was driving to work. I mean, that was my stretch to get to um, Hartford. Um, and I was like, w would it be possible to kind of put murals there? And not just any murals, but something that is reflective of the demographic of the greater Hartford area. You know, you know the first troubadour, you know, rap troubadour, and all the different Jamaican residents who you know, have farmed uh, for many decades here. All, could we incorporate that, but use those people who have, um, have tags on their wall as like the spearheads, like the people who are actually gonna be the vanguard of, of, of the work themselves? And I approached them and they said, well, you know, it's not gang territory, you know, because we were talking about, you know, who would we offend? <laughs> um, they said, no, it's not technically gang territory, but we know someone who's a tag artist on the wall. Um, we should consult with him. So, you know, after I talked to him, he said, no, it's not gang territory per se, but it is graffiti gang territory. Um, I didn't know such thing existed. So apparently... Um, the tags that are on that wall are not just from people who are local, but people who have come from Japan, you know, far from places to add their story to that stretch. And some of the work there dates back to the early 80s, you know, so it's almost like a museum in itself. So by the end of the conversation, he said, you know, Michelle, I think, I think you can go somewhere from that with this. Beginning of the conversation, he said, no, there's no way that, you know, folk would be amenable. There's too many moving parts and whatnot. So because of the scope of the project, we said, okay, well, we have to figure out how we can do this in a way that isn't, doesn't feel like a top-down approach, you know, that we're not coming with our ideas. It really has to come from those who are most affected and where this mural sits, you know, um, would sit. Um, so we said, okay, well, while that's happening, what else can we do? Um, one of the members uh, told me, Michelle, go to Three Constitution Plaza and tell me what you think. So I had to put in, you know, MapQuest, or rather, whatever Google, whatever utility I used at the time. It wasn't MapQuest. MapQuest is like, you know, um, <laughs> dating myself. Um, and I'm like, it's a hole in the ground. Why is there a hole in the ground right next to all of these, you know, stately buildings? And, you know, what, what is this? So, you know, I was looking at it. I said, you know, this would make a wonderful park. And it's funny because at, when I saw mm -hmm. the... Uh, a little bit about this project, mm -hmm. Reconstitution. Mm -hmm. It's like when I drive to Hartford, I drive over that Route Two bridge. That's right. And it's like a block away. It's right there. I mean, you're, you're if you if you end up at, at a red light instead of just breezing through, you have this giant hole to your right looking at you. And I said, well, you know, what a waste. I mean, you have the museum. If you stand in the second floor bathroom, I think it was a men's bathroom because I was in there with my son, we're looking out at the window and we see this hole. <laughs> <laughs> so we've looked at this hole from different angles. And it's like, this is just ridiculous. This is a waste. So, you know, I, didn't, I, I contacted, um, you know, uh, city officials to find out who was the owner. Nobody really knew. So I had to do my own research to find out who the gentleman was. Um, it turns out he's been, you know, sitting on this property for several years. Initially, he wanted to build 
um, like a semi apartment complex office building. But, you know, the time wasn't right. The money wasn't, you know, worth it. So he just left it to be blighted. And when I checked with the blight office, they had warned him several times to clean up the lot. Um, so I reminded them that the lot needs to be cleaned up. If he's going to have to, he's going to, if he's going to have it in this condition, you know, pretty much fallow, he needs to at least cut the grass and whatnot. And they, he did follow through. He did cut the uh, grass and whatnot. Um, I also learned that that space belongs to three different owners. So it's the gentleman who owns three Constitution Plaza. It's the gentleman who owns one Constitution Plaza where that wall is. And then it's a collaborative of folk who own the, um, the apartment complex right there at, was that five to eight Constitution Plaza or something or the other. Um, so, you know, it's been interesting to try to negotiate between these three different entities that don't want to talk to each other. Like the owner of one Constitution Plaza does not want to have anything to do with the gentleman who owns three Constitution Plaza. And when the three Constitution Plaza went on the market, he said he wasn't even interested in buying it, even though he was in a position to do so. And wow. it's abutting his property, not interested. So, you know, I went to the, the, the folks who were attached to five Constitution Plaza, um, posited to them the possibility of creating a mural that went up one side of their building and then went on to one Constitution Plaza and they were all for it. However, they wanted um, to see an actual mock, you know, uh, demonstration of what the mural would look like before they would go ahead and, and, and uh, um, approve it. And one's Constitution said, do whatever you wish. The wall is yours. You know, I'm open to whatever, you know, as long as it doesn't, you know, within, you know, respect for people's decency and all of that stuff. So do whatever you wish. So the sticking point now is trying to work with the gentleman who still owns Three Constitution Plaza, and it's been, it's been a trial, several months in the making. So, but that land still hasn't had anything? No one done. has bought it. Um, the last check was a couple of weeks ago. It's still there. He's not listing the price. He's looking for people to suggest a price for it. Well, unfortunately, that seems to be where we are. I don't know if it's nationwide or just in Connecticut, but mm -hmm. I know in, in New London, a lot of houses are being sold to uh, corporate owners yes. for far higher than the appraised value yeah. to you know, entities that can pay cash. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have to get a bank loan. So it doesn't matter that they're buying it for more than it's worth. Right. And it's really taking a lot of property out of other important uses in the city. Mm -hmm. And I consider urban parks one of A those very important, important use. use. Yeah. So, you know, going back to this, this first gathering in my living room about possibilities, you know, we wanted to approach, um, to use art as a vector towards beautification, towards reclaiming blighted properties towards, um, you know, building up, you know, community-led initiatives in state, you know, in, in Hartford area and surrounding areas. We also wanted to collaborate more actively with partners that are often forgotten, so our First Nations people who are both recognized and not recognized by the state. Um, so originally when, when we were looking at possible designs for the park, it was going to be like a combination of, you know, ADA accessible seating areas, um, garden boxes, fruiting trees, a stage for public performances. Um, we were also going to have um, the mural itself would be, unlike other murals in the area, a talking mural. So you'd be able to scan your you know, QR code to hear the story of the person who's represented in the mural. Um, the vision for the mural was predominantly mine, you know, and I had to call um, and email several times the Norman Rockwell Museum up in Mass to get permission. But my vision was that we would do a reinterpretation of the Golden Rule by Norman Rockwell using the faces of the people of Hartford. Um, and their story was to talk about how they arrived in Hartford and what keeps them there, right? As far as they know it, right? Um, so I was, my, my hope was that people would volunteer and not only share their story, but be able to create their own like miniature legacy. It would be an opportunity to sit for a formal portrait and to, to have their story shared in like a coffee table book that you know, could be shared with others and, and read at different gatherings. And you know, so they, they really feel that they're part of the history that they're making in Hartford because history is alive in the people that live here you know, um, in this state. So that was the hope for the, uh, the space. And it was tentatively rever referred to as urban sanctuary urban sanctuary at, um, at Three Constitution Plaza, um, also known as US at Three oh. Constitution Plaza. 
So, yeah. So that's still sort of... It's still ongoing. It, it, I mean, you know, the owner of Three Con Supplies really thinks I'm going to give up. He sent his attorneys. He sent, <laughs> sent all kind of big dogs, you know. Um, I'm a bigger dog, apparently. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't get worn out very quickly. So, you know, I'm just being very patient. Uh, what I'm looking at is, you know, um, trying to uh, make a connection with a, a bunch of the different city councils in the area about the project itself. Um, so what I've learned is that if you don't, if they don't know you personally, and particularly if you don't live in Hartford proper, you're less likely to get an ear. Um, so, you know, it's been, it's been really difficult. Um, as many times as I've asked to, you know, present at different spaces and places, um, I have not gotten any kind of feedback. I think the, the part of the pushback is like, well, who are you? <laughs> you know, who are you? And, you know, but I'm like, I, I've been here. I've been here, so you know. Hopefully, I can uh, um, create a space for much more dialogue, and which which is what led me to the idea of having these community dinners. So, and I go to Asylum Hill Congregational Church. I, I refer to myself as the prodigal daughter um, because I had been missing in action for several years. And when I walked into church for the first time um, a few Sundays ago, uh, the lead pastor recognized me and opened her arms, recognized me by name. Um, and that, that meant a lot to me after so long, you know. Um, and she has, not she, but the church has um, every Sunday this opportunity for people to come and get a meal. You just, they acknowledge your presence because they're keeping a running tally, but, you know, it doesn't matter where you are. So I was standing there in my church clothes, getting my meal, and then going and sitting in the car and eating it, just like everybody else, you know. Um, and I noticed that, you know, when we have these events for um, communities, you know, it's often stand-up or standing in the vicinity only. You know, very rarely do you have a chance to sit down at a table with cloth napkins and silverware and actually engage in conversation with the other people around you. So um, it, it's a very different approach to do so, but that's what the hope of All Families Dinner, um, originally scheduled for January but moved to February, was going to be about. Yeah, so. January is a tough month anyway. It is, it is. Um, you know, just looking at what, what's out there in terms of all the different events, I would be, I'm not a competitive per person, I'm ambitious, there's a difference for me. Um, but I don't want to get in the way of offering something that would interrupt other things that are established, you know what I mean? So, you know, fortunately I have a really good connection with Kate Schramm at the Connecticut uh, Museum for History and Culture. Um, I call her my guardian angel because it seems like everywhere I look, she's there. Uh, <laughs> we got a grant, Project Tunnel Vision got a grant um, to create two create a program around storytelling, visual arts, performing arts attached to said community dinner. Um, and we're looking at Black History Month um, and, you know, tailoring program for that month for that dinner. So, you know, to be continued. It's interesting that you mentioned the, uh, that things like cloth na napkins and tablecloths are not something that people usually associate with, you know, just casual getting of food, but, you know, I was a preschool teacher in my former life, mm -hmm. and one thing we did, we didn't have cloth napkins, but when I worked for Head Start, uh, mealtime is actually a component of the curriculum yes. in, in Head Start. And uh, one thing we really did in the beginning in my classroom, we got rid of all the rectangular tables, and we got round tables round like tables. this one, and we didn't get cloth tablecloths but we got like the vinyl tablecloths that were fake lace that you see yes. in events all over the place beautiful and we had kids make centerpieces and yes and they were so into it having our snack because mm -hmm. they were it was only a, a two-hour play group mm -hmm. uh, so we didn't really even serve a whole meal it was snack but it was on tablecloths with centerpieces. Which is perfect. A, a few weeks ago, my, you know, my employer works with other contracted providers in, in the area, and they threw a Thanksgiving meal, and it was the first time I got a chance to approach. And I was thinking the same thing. They're probably just going to have food in a styrofoam container. Here you go. Go back to your congregate home setting. It was the exact opposite. I walked in there. There were tables, round tables with tablecloths centerpieces coffee was being brewed it seemed like every five minutes 
and people felt oh, we missed so, that with the yeah, three year olds. The, the, yeah, with the three year olds. You know, I'm sure they understand. Uh, <laughs> but you can see on their faces how special they felt, you know? And they were being served food. They didn't have to get up and go get it. They were being served food. You know, so when I see that, it's like appealing to your own sense of a person's dignity. That they, you know, despite where they come from, what they know, that they can actually sit down and have a meal in such a setting, and they're worth that. And, you know, it shouldn't be a one-off experience. You know, it should happen as often as possible. So for the event, you know, um, I made it sliding scale, so whatever a person can afford, whether it's 20 cents or $20, you get the same quality of meal. You know, you get the opportunity to, you know, listen to people's stories and then share your own story and hopefully walk away feeling like you're connected to something greater than yourself, you know. Um, so that's the hope. And I remember growing up, too, that we had a dining room. You know, West Indian folk usually have a dining room that's just for company. Nobody goes in the dining room. <laughs> <laughs> Just for company, and the, everything is there. The place settings, everything is perfectly there. Never go in the dining room. We sat there with our plates in our hands every meal. So with my son, I said, I'm not doing that. And I believe you and your husband came over and assembled said dining room table that I'm refer about to refer yeah. to uh, <laughs> with me when I was clueless about it. But every dinner, we sit down at the dining room table and have dinner together. It makes a world of difference. It makes a world of difference. So, yeah. well, the thing you said about the, the sliding fee, though, kind of struck me also because it seems as though, I don't know if it's due to zoning, my mm. brain is on zoning a lot, uh, or just housing patterns nowadays, mm. but it seems as though there's less uh, mixing uh, across socioeconomic lines yes. than ever before. Agreed. Uh, sometimes there's more mixing across racial lines and ethnic lines, but just the way housing works and zoning works, you're very likely to be living on a block of people who all have about the same worth yeah. financially. Yeah. Um, I was very intentional in choosing um, the Mandel JCC Jewish Community Center because it was right on the border of West Hartford. Um, folk can get to it. And it's a community center that has a reputation of being very open and inclusive to, action, to everyone, right? Um, so I wanted to appeal to people who may feel comfortable going there to, for their gallery events, um, to be as equally comfortable to sit down with their neighbor from, uh, you know, two blocks north and having a meal with them, you know. But you're right. I mean, class, class seems to be like the last frontier to traverse in, in, in recent years. And, you know... It, the strongest among, among us has just have to make it happen. They really just have to make it happen. Yeah, it, it's tough. I, mm -hmm. I kid you not, but a couple of weeks ago there was a presentation in uh, Hamden mm. called something like Zoning Reform to Create Happier, Healthier Communities. Oh, God bless them all. And, uh, and it was really interesting mm. uh, about uh, the origins of zoning being, um, having bases a basis in historic uh, eu eugenic yes. theory yes. Uh, and, and separating people initially uh, by, you know, race and ethnicity, but it's become socioeconomic and we just don't have the connections that we did in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have, we still have among us so many different, you know, pillars of, of, of of experience um, that we can revisit. I include you as, am as among the people that I think of um, who have deep roots in this state and, you know, can be looked to for guidance on how we can address these long-standing divisions, you know. Um, it, it can't, it, it's not sustainable. It's really not sustainable. Um, we lose so much out of, you know, being so separated by um, these, you know, um, forced divisions. Um, and we have so much to gain removing them and actually getting to see each other for who we are, you know, just human beings, you know, a blip in the, the timeline of the, the, the existence of everything. Um, so I'm still hopeful, though. I'm still hopeful. I try to be hopeful, but I have to admit, I don't always succeed. I grew up in Philadelphia, yeah. and it's like a hundred times the size of New London, right. but it's got some things in common Quite that is... Now, in the 50s and 60s, which were the decades I, I lived in Philadelphia, mm. um, 
you know, it's a very diverse city, but also a very segregated very city. So. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I didn't know any black people who were not working as domestic, for example, right. until I was in high school, I don't think. Well, you know, for a lot of Caribbean folk, especially the women, that was your entry point, you know. If you were lucky enough to get sponsored, that's where you went. You were live in or live out domestic. And then from you, whatever you save, whatever you manage to pull together, you would slowly bring your relatives here. And they will go and get their blue collar and black collar jobs until they can do something or afford to do something more. And then, you know, kind of, you know, since I'm first generation, I felt the brunt of that. You must do X. <laughs> You know, for my, you know, my father, I remember him holding my hand saying, you're going to be a doctor, Michelle. So I'm, I'm a couple years late, Dad, but uh, I'm applying for the PsyD program in counseling psychology at <laughs> University of Hartford. So hopefully I, I'm doing you proud. But, you know, the, the whole sense of, of how, much you, how much our families have given up, you know, um, to have a life for not just themselves but their children, it really needs to be honored and respected. Um, so in my small way, I, I hope to do that. I, you know, I think people need to be reminded sometimes of how strong they truly are and how much they have to offer to each other. And if it means just having you know, a few minutes at a dinner table, just sharing that um, and, and really believing that, then I've done, I've done what I'm called to do. Yeah. Now, do you feel as though, or do you hope that this kind of dinner will turn into a, I don't know, a regular, a regular thing, oh, quarterly, that would be lovely. monthly. Oh my gosh, that would be amazing. And you know, to really showcase the different, um, you know, veteran-owned, women-owned, black and brown, you know, native-owned businesses, you name it, in the area, whether they're coming as uh, uh, vendors or they're actually contributing in terms of the, the program itself, or even, you know, if they're providing um, entertainment and foodstuffs, you know, I really want it to be reflective of um, the beauty of Hartford, and, uh, the greater Hartford area and Connecticut as a whole, you know. So if it means that, yeah, you know, we meet on a regular basis, I would love for that to become canon. It would be amazing. It would be amazing. Now, are you focusing with this on the Hartford area or is all of Connecticut part um, of it? How, how do you envision this community coming together? Um, I am focused on Hartford um, for the moment. I think that, you know, this is where... Um, you know, Project Tunnel Vision, you know, first, the, the seed fair was first planted. Um, so I feel like I owe Hartford um, a thanks. You know, this is, you know, the park, you know, if it becomes an actuality is, is definitely my love letter to Hartford. And um, so I'm, you know, I'm hoping to really focus on what's here in the area and what's here, I'm, you know, um, referring to, you know, the downtown areas and the different neighborhoods. What I would like it to do is to expand beyond that and perhaps maybe showcase the different neighborhoods and different towns and cities. So if we have a new London dinner, it would be awesome, you know? Um, if we have a, a um, oh gosh, what is it, Salisbury, way up in the corner? Uh, <laughs> um, I yep, don't know. Yep, way up in the northeast uh, the corner, 169 towns, who yep. can keep them all straight? Yep, yep, yep. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the amount of diversity, you know, the Connecticut is often knocked as being pretty monochromatic, but there's a tremendous amount of diversity um, in this state if you look for it. And sometimes you really don't have to look that far, you know. You don't, so. but it, it, I, I do even in, in New London feel as though like Philadelphia of my childhood, it's very diverse and people generally feel very proud of that. Yes. But our neighborhoods are still pretty segregated. Yes. And, uh, we don't necessarily meet people outside of our neighborhoods. You know, well, my neighborhood's sort of in the middle. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of some neighborhoods are still, you know, kind of like Connecticut suburbs. Yeah. I mean, I remember growing up with people who never really left, you know, a square mile radius of where they were born. You know, they they grew up on that block. They stay on that block. No passport. No, <laughs> you know, haven't even been to the city because everything was local. You know. And, and I, I, I often wonder if it's like for a safety issue. Like initially, you know, you, you, you were told that this is where you're supposed to stay and you don't belong anywhere else. Um, I remember my, one of my godparents had a house in Camden, New Jersey, and um, they were on the wrong side of the tracks. <laughs> um, but initially they were on the right side of the tracks and that's why they bought the house so they can be, you know, they were considered like an up and coming area. But, you know, as, it, as that line 
changed. Um, you know, the the neighborhood unfortunately um, went downhill, and well, it probably was a disinvestment. A huge disinvestment. So you know, it wasn't the people's fault per se. It was just the fact that what was once there you removed itself. This, the the jobs, the supermarkets, and all of that. So. You know, people left it and abandoned it to go find a place where they would be closer to those amenities. You know, um, so when I lived there, it was it was pretty it was pretty bad. You know, um, it was a challenge leaving the the house in the morning because I didn't know what was outside. I literally did not know what was outside my door. Um, so you know, I, I totally get that. Per, you know, that for many people it may be a safety issue. Um, I'm not going to stray beyond these boundaries because on the other side, there you know, someone would want to hurt me or take away what I have. You know. But, you know, we really have to be a lot more brave um, because, you know, we're all, um, we all belong here. No matter how we arrived or when we arrived, we all belong here. And we should lay claim to all of it. And I think one other piece of it is that there are some real challenges that we are facing that uh, were part of, but didn't really originate with us. Things mm. like climate change. Oh, New London is on the coast. Right. A lot of Connecticut is coastal. Yeah. And uh, things like climate change, things like the way industry is you know, getting built up mm -hmm. that is not benefiting people across the board. And we ha you know, the great income gaps we have. Mm -hmm. and, and we have to kind of work on those things as a community, whether mm -hmm. We like each other or not. Exactly. They're shared. They're shared issues and shared challenges. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember it was. You know, we had talked about this earlier. It's pretty disturbing how you know one sole industry be, can can be used as like the departure point for investments of certain types, like building luxury communities and you know building a Whole Foods and having a mall within a half a mile distance or whatnot. You know, that's solely for the purpose of catering to a very small demographic that doesn't contribute nearly as much you know, quantitatively when you look at the working classes as anybody else, you know. And the whole 95 corridor, you know, there was a willingness to look at rail, but only downstate. You know, no one was thinking about, okay, how can we get back and forth to Springfield, or how can we get back and forth to other aspects of the state for commuter purposes more than anything else. You know, that wasn't interesting, that wasn't sexy, you know. So, you know, I think when we refocus on what the greater need is um, without sounding, uh, um, you know, patently socialist to some people who may, may see that as a, as a byline, then we actually can make a difference for everyone. But, yeah, again. Well, you know, I think I even related this on last week's show when I was mm -hmm. talk, talking to someone about uh, a transit system and oh commuter rail, because um, at one time, maybe 10, 15 years ago, mm -hmm. there was a lot of talk about a, a central corridor line from New London to Brattleboro That's that right. went through a dozen co college campuses, uh, you know, in Norwich, in Willimannock, Mansfield, mm -hmm. up uh, in Massachusetts, Palmer, Massachusetts, That's right. and um, and it sounded like such a fantastic idea. Mm -hmm. And now, the latest thing I'm hearing on the rail front is that the federal government, the FRA, is more interested in high speed rail right. that traverses Connecticut, right. that the big goal is to get people from New York to Boston mm -hmm. quickly, or mm -hmm. from Washington, D.C., or Philadelphia to Boston quickly, mm -hmm. than to actually serve the people in Connecticut. Right. And, and I feel as though our state often does kind of get I don't know, treated like a corridor to somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, a way station, right? You know, and it's not fair to folks here. And, I, and you know, I, I remember looking at the, 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 the maps for um, uh, freight rail. I mean, we already have the systems in place. We would just have to, you know, update and, and refab it in order to make that possible. And it would yeah. be such a boon to so many different communities, especially people who have college age kids or those who are, you know, considered adult learners and then going back to school to advance themselves. And I now consider myself a part of that, to be able to go back and forth without I'd have to relying on a car, you know. And I think of all those kids that would love to go to Mystic, but it's just too far. But if we had a rail system there, we can take whole classes to go and experience what it's like, you know, to go to the, the, the different museum and the old Mystic and, you know, just that for example. I mean, we have so much to offer in this state. And I think if we made it a lot more mobile um, to people on, a co on the community side, it, it, it really would be just outstanding. It would be outstanding.
When I was on the Board of Ed, like almost 15 years ago, there was yeah. one student who came to, his family came mm -hmm. uh, to the board, and the student was very talented, and mm -hmm. he wanted to attend the arts uh, magnet school in Willimantic. Mm -hmm. And he wanted the school system to pay for his transportation there. And the people, in, you know, the pencil pushers in the office, mm -hmm. they got a couple quotes from a livery service and from different places. And the cost of transporting this kid to school from uh, New London to Willimantic was about $25,000 a year. And then, but then, you know, I looked at uh, Shoreline East, mm -hmm. and they had student passes, mm -hmm. and a student could go to New Haven, which is actually a little farther than Willimantic, right. for about $4,000 a year just getting student passes. I don't so. even think it was 4000 It was some, but it was like a fifth at most of, uh, of the cost to yeah. go to Willimantic to take Shoreline East. Right. using student passes. Right. And I thought, well, if we had that central corridor line, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be an issue. This kid could take take the train. That's As it right. was, my comment was, you know, your parents could just rent an apartment in Willimantic for That's less right. money than that and, you know, live in Willimantic four mm -hmm. nights a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it, it was crazy, but you know, having that rail line could have made a huge difference to this one student mm -hmm. and, of course, to many of us who travel up to Willimantic or Mansfield mm -hmm. or farther farther north. I remember growing up in, in Brooklyn, um, you know, my mom, you know, you know, taught me early on how to use and how to navigate the transit system, you know. I, I used to tease her and say, you have the map of New York State in your head, you know, because she knew every line, every connector, <laughs> everything. This is really crazy. Um, so I remember standing on a station platform, and she looked at me seriously, and she said, Michelle, I want you to remember one thing in particular. All roads lead to home. If you go somewhere and it doesn't look right, turn around <laughs> and come back. All roads lead to home. So, you know, um, myself and my peers, we were on those trains from the time we could, you know, go to, you know, whether it's uh, secondary school and high school. And, you know, I wonder sometimes, is it the fear that, you know, kids would be too you know, exposed to a reality outside of their own where they, you know, start to question what goes on outside of their, their little niche in this particular area. Um, it, it really truly makes me wonder. But it was second nature, you know, to hop on a train and end up, you know, two hours away looking at, you know, sculptures on a wall in a museum. It was totally, totally. I think that yeah. for those of us who grew up in cities in, you know, 30, 40, 50 years mm -hmm. ago, uh, th it really was a different attitude. I remember when I was 11 years old, that summer during vacation, yeah. a, a, a friend and I, two girls who were like fifth graders, mm -hmm. um, went to downtown Philadelphia taking the train. That's right. My mom made us a little map of Market Street and Chestnut Street. I love it. And when, it was when we wanted to go home, we, you know, used the payphone and said, oh, we're going to take the train right. back. And my mom picked us up at the train station, which was only about a half mile from our house, mm -hmm. but it was still a little bit of a sketchy neighborhood. That's right. So it's really funny that the one place she felt like we had to be supervised was the last half mile from our house. But we had been walking all oh, around downtown. Down. Yep. There were no cell phones. If nope. we had not called back, they would have no idea <laughs> where where to look. Yeah. And I just, sometimes I marvel at how brave our parents oh were. Oh my gosh, yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, you know, it, it was just a whole other world, and I, I really wish it was a world that I could share with my son, you know, um, because we had tremendous freedom, even in the midst of, you know, trying to figure out how to manage, you know, the mortgage payments and all of that stuff. You know, I still had my little allowance. I still was able to, you know, participate in a lot of community-related stuff. You know, I was at the MoMA. I was in all these different places. And, you know, I, it's an experience that I really credit to my willingness to really explore what I know and, um, you know, to force myself to be more uncomfortable, you know, to get to know things that I don't know um, because it really does make me a better person overall. So. I wish I could share that with him. So all I have is my stories right now. You know. So this 
question is sort of related to your professional life, uh, which is, um, are people more stressed out now than they were like 10, 15, 20 years ago? And if so, like what are the pressures? What are, what are we not getting as humans living in the society that might be making more people more vulnerable? Oh. Although you can tell me I'm totally wrong and that's not the case. No, I, I think it's very much the case. I mean, I know they've done studies over the you know, last, pre, even pre-COVID, even though we'll never be rid of COVID, COVID is just going to evolve with us. Um, but pre-COVID, you know, they had talked about, you know, the last two or three generations being so removed from each other, you know, despite having access to the World Wide Web and, you know, all these different gadgets and whatnot that were originally designed uh, to make us a lot closer to the world, closer at hand. So I think that there, there's a sense of disconnect between what's actually happening to people around the world. Um, you know, if we're not personally affected by it, it's hard to get a sense of how that really changes, you know, our current living situation. I think that's still very much relevant. Um, in my practice, I see um, a lot of non-traditional uh, folks coming in the door. I mean, when you think of, the stereotype is, when you think of someone who is struggling from substance abuse or, you know, a, a, a mental health disorder on Axis One or Axis Two that, you know, they're destitute, they're down on their luck, but, you know, no, we see the working class to upper class person who, you know, on the outside seems like they're well put together, um, but on the inside that they're really struggling and they have multiple habits that they're trying to balance. Where I currently work right now, um, we're working with those who have no other, other place to go, you know, for whatever reason, um, there aren't services available to them, so they come back to the state to get, you know, the services that are due. But, you know, just looking back at the last couple of years, it's just been people who can't make it. You know, it does, you know, as we had mentioned earlier, it's just, it's the, it's the boiler failing. It's, um, you know, the car payment um, that was missed because there was, you know, some extra payments to pay for, for bills, utility bills. It was, you know, it was always something. And if I would think that for most people that, you know, once a major happening occurs, you know, it really throws the rest of their plans into, you know, into a tizzy. And... I don't think people are recovering as fast as they would like to and are finding themselves living in cars and they're finding themselves deciding, okay, how much can I afford to, you know, set aside to eat today and, you know, my children eat first and I eat last. I even do that for myself, you know, um, with my son. He eats first, I eat last. Um, but yeah, I, I think that more than ever we need to um, rely on each other in ways that we may have felt uncomfortable to do before. And it means putting down our screens and actually sitting around in spaces such as these and just getting to know each other. Um, I think that um, mutual aid is, you know, one of the cure, cures to being able to get through um, the level of disconnectedness that we have. You know, the different, when people decide, you know what, uh, <laughs> I got a few dollars, let me, you know, pitch in and do this, or I got a couple hours, let me go and help, you know, sit this person's uh, child while they're taking a couple hours off in a night shift. I think, you know, having these different communities that are run by the communities themselves um, and fashioned around mutual benefit um, is one of the things that's going to get us through in the next however long. I know, now I'll be the one to sound like a socialist, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, we, you I know, mean, we, I, I identify as an eco-socialist, and I, you know, I, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure yeah. folk have a problem with that, but that's okay. That, you know, I, I, I don't really identify myself as a socialist, but I spent part of my life as a practicing socialist, yes, and I did spend a very short part of my life as a practicing libertarian. We, we spent one summer. Really? We spent one summer in Oregon in the 1970s. Wow. Uh, in a living in a teepee on private land, but was not accessible by uh, any public road. It, it, you got wow. accessed it through a logging road. So we had no phone, no electricity, no running water, no phone service. I guess maybe there's self service in that area now, but wow. maybe not. Um, so we, we lasted about three months. Beco uh, uh, and now That's I'm impressive. convinced that you can't be a libertarian and live in a city can't. because you're already so dependent on the social value of 
shared utilities That's and right. paved roads That's and right. getting you know your road plowed and your trash picked up. We had none of that stuff. Mm. So I wouldn't say we were total libertarians, but we were we would live uh, without a lot of what those social social uh, advantages were. That's we didn't awesome. last very long. I, I'm waiting for the chapter in that book. I mean, that, that sounds fascinating. I would yeah. love to hear about those three months. Um, <laughs> it, wow. it, 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 yeah, it, um, I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I guess you know, it, it was a, a, an interesting learning experience. But to, to sound socialist, I think we already assume that you know our town we live in is going to um, you know plow the snow mm -hmm. in in winter mm -hmm. and they will have hopefully potable water coming out of our taps right. and we'll have electricity uh, but you know there's more that people need as human rights yes. that our communities could help provide for us absolutely we need love we need connection we need validation we need support um, you know we, we need you know mutual respect um, and we need to remember where we came from. You know? Yeah, and during my practicing socialist years, you know, it, we were members of a kibbutz, um, and uh, we, um, if you were there, mm. you had a bed to sleep in. Yeah. They told you where to go to work in the morning. You got meals. You got your laundry done. Uh, it was a six-day work week, and it wow. actually was less stressful than a five-day work week here because. You didn't spend one whole full day catching up on chores because it was someone's job to do the laundry and the cooking and uh, a lot of the other things, the trash and the... Wow. So it, it, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a nurse who lived on the premises. Um, so yeah, I, I feel as though our governments could, you know, take care of some of these needs that aren't quite as straightforward as just, you know, our public utilities. Yeah, I think so. I think we, we're worth the investment. Yeah, you yeah, know. We're definitely worth the investment. Food, a roof over our heads, mm -hmm. uh, health care. Mm -hmm. These are all things that if everyone had them, maybe we would have more time to feel connected. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Well, in the last four minutes, I want you to tell people how to get in touch with you if they're interested in pursuing, Ooh. you know, getting involved in Project Tunnel Vision in any way. Um, Absolutely. Um, so, you know, our web presence is very limited. Um, you can find us on Facebook through um, search for Project Tunnel Vision. We have a basic site there, and it has contact information that, that comes directly to myself as project lead. Uh, we're always looking for volunteers, eager and enthusiastic volunteers of any age. Um, we're particularly keen on finding, and I'm saying we as if it's like a whole bunch of us, but it will be. Will be. Um, we are <laughs> looking for artists, um, you know, non-traditional artists who haven't have a chance to really hone their craft publicly. Um, so, you know, feel free to give us uh, a ring. My direct email is uh, proj, P-R-O-J, Tunnel Vision, which is one word, T-U-N-N-E-L-V-I-S-I-O-N -N -E at gmail.com. That's the fastest way to reach us. So. Okay. And, you know, I was thinking, I wonder, does Eastern and um, Central doesn't still have a mural department, uh, but, you know... Uh, I don't know. I, don't I know a, a, a lot of it, um, the, the, the organization that, that is a city-level organization that works with arts-related um, oh. projects. Um, you know, they have been very, very uh, supportive of different mural projects throughout the city. Um, but I'm not sure if there are any um, like mural departments in any of the universities. It would be really helpful. So if anybody has any university connections, um, well, you know, definitely reach out. Well, a retired CCSU muralist, mural oh. professor, lives in New London. Ooh. So uh, he's been retired for a while, but he, Mike Alowitz, he does... Uh, Anyway, he's been on the show too. Uh, but yes, I we'll, we'll, we can ma maybe make a connection. Love it. Uh, so thank you, Michelle. It was nice to sit down with you oh after gosh. after I don't know thirteen months. Oh my or gosh! Something. It's we been we too have long. to do this. Yes, we must do this again. We must do this again. Thank you so much. And, for and your latest project seems uh, 
as always, something that's really big and interesting and uh, sounds fun to get involved in. Thank you, Valora. Thank you. So next week, um, Eddie Long is going to be back on the show. Uh, we uh, Last week, Keith was on kind of debriefing our municipal election from the Board of Ed point of view, and Eddie slash Leon will talk about the mayoral race and what he's continuing to do as co-chair of the New London Arts Council. Wow. So uh, tune in then. Uh, I'm sure the phone number will be posted so you can ask questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, to get in touch with Michelle uh, on the subject of uh, Project Tunnel Vision, it's P-R-O-G-T-U-N-N-E-L-V-I-S-I-O-N -N -E at gmail.com. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, thanks for coming down. Thank you so much. Yeah. We'll see you all next week. <laughs>